Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. One of the things I talk about is view teachings and what view teachings are and why view teachings are important. Most of the teachings that you get in this kind of tradition in Dzogchen and Chan Buddhism and uh, Taoism are very heavily weighted toward view teachings. View teachings answer questions like, what is reality? Why do we do spiritual practice? What is a person? Do we have a soul? Is there time? Those kinds of questions. How do how are we supposed to orient ourselves when we sit down to do seated practice, etc.? View teachings answer the bigger questions about a tradition, and they give you the biggest context for practicing in a tradition. Every single book that I've written, except for perhaps the poetry books, has a little exposition in the beginning about the importance of view teachings. It's something we really want to understand. The other thing that's different about view teachings in the direct realization traditions is that the view is actually the biggest view. It's the most all-encompassing, absolute view. And then, of course, there's a view about relative life, too. But normally, when you get view teachings, you're getting a very big view. And this is a little bit of a different teaching method than we might be used to, even just from regular school, but particularly from American Buddhist traditions, where relative teachings, where the teachings that relate only to our condition as limited beings are given first. And then this bigger view, this more absolute cosmic sized view is really saved until later on, if ever given. So in the direct realization traditions, the teaching method is big first, then go small. And it's very, very deliberate because it's assumed that there are going to be people in many different conditions hearing any particular teaching. And as Abhinavagupta said many times, someone might hear the big view and really just immediately get it. And so this is for those people. And then for the people who get a little bit of it or maybe a little less, at least it gives you an idea of what universe you're practicing in and how it's maybe different from some other tradition that you're practicing in or that you grew up in. Because what happens is if we practice not understanding the view of the tradition that we're practicing in, then we're going to fill in the blanks with other views from other traditions that we've been in or maybe just absorbed around what I like to call the spiritual water cooler. So, for instance, if you have just heard or you've practiced in a tradition where you're taught to witness your thoughts or witness your breath, and you don't realize that that instruction relates to a very big view about the nature of reality. And then I tell you to do something uh, called meditation, and you don't understand the view of this tradition, which is to lose the watcher, to not take up the position of the witness. If you don't understand that, then you're just going to fall back on what feels most comfortable. And then you're going to have a completely different result. There's a huge difference in result between watching your breath and, as we say, becoming immersed in the breath or becoming the breath. It's a very, very different instruction. And so you want to understand why you're being given this different instruction so you can really grok that and stay on course with the practice that you're given and get the result that you're supposed to get. The little teaching that I posted from Abhinavagupta is a view teaching. And the teaching is diversity is the sole cause of both bondage and liberation. Diversity is the sole cause 
of both bondage and liberation. And of course, this is very relevant to our moment now, but it is relevant all the time, actually. (laughs) So we can have two, just in general, two different experiences of diversity. Diversity is another way of saying duality. Diversity is maybe a more understandable way of saying duality. So when we say that you are experiencing dualistic vision or you're having dualistic experience, that means that you're having a real experience of there being more than one thing in, the, in reality. There's you, there's your people, there's everybody else, there's animals and trees and cars and cities and worlds and probably multiple universes, maybe even mirror universes and parallel universes. (laughs) So that's duality. Dual, it has the word dual in it, and it means two. The Sanskrit word for that is bheda, B-H-E-D-A. So... Beta is the experience of more than one thing. And if we are in dualistic karmic vision, then we actually have a conviction or at least an embodied experience of being separate bodies in space and there being separate objects and separate worlds. So that's one experience of diversity. We have this experience that diversity is kind of a collection of things that are separate and different. That experience of diversity is bondage. And what bondage means in this context is another Sanskrit word, avidya. It means not having complete understanding of the nature of reality. You also may have heard uh, around the spiritual water cooler, or if you've studied some other traditions from India or even Tibet, that this world is unreal. You may have heard that teaching. So just mark a note if you're taking notes or mark a note in your brain that this tradition does not subscribe to the idea that unreality exists. This tradition says there unreality can't exist. There's no such thing as unreality. Only real can exist. It's very quite simple. But for some reason, some people don't think so. I don't know why. So when we're having dualistic experience, we are having a real experience of separation. And that experience is made, it's being produced by this, the one subjectivity that is all of reality. So it is happening within, you could say, the body of reality, this experience of dualistic karmic vision or diversity experienced in the way that we think it's real, that separation is real, that objects are really separated in space and that we are really separate individual beings. That's dualistic karmic vision, or or you could say (laughs) diversity karmic vision. There's no such phrase as that, but to use a more familiar term. That experience is absolutely real. It's a partial experience of the nature of reality. It is just not the whole thing. So it ha- it's partially unknowing. It's partially ignorant. But it is not unreal because it's a real experience. The other way that we could experience diversity is from a base of experiencing continuity. So if our, the gates of our perceptions were more open, if we were deeply, widely, profoundly experiencing the nature of the self with our, all of our senses wide open, including our mind, we would perceive that there are no objects. We would perceive that directly with our own senses. You know how some people have more sensitivity in their hearing, or they have more sensitivity in their smell, or they are more intuitive in some way or more insightful in some way or more creative in some way. We all know that there are variations in people's senses. We know that there are variations in our own senses. We know that 
some of our senses might be sharper than others. We may be better in our sensory capacity than some other people we know, or not as, as good as some other people we know. We're somewhere, you know, there's a continuum. And we also know there are people who have what we call more extraordinary experiences of their senses. You could call these shamans or, you know, other kinds of people who can gain insight through what we think of as extraordinary means. The opening of the gates of the senses that happens when you do spiritual practice and you're more realized is an extension of that natural variation. It just so happens that what we think of as the normal range of senses is very, very small on the band of possibilities, on the continuum of possibilities. So what we're doing when we're doing sadhana is we are getting, we are destroying impediments to our senses, our body, energy, and mind. And then we are able to see and ex experience it with our body, energy, and mind, the nature of reality directly with our own senses. This is called gaining confidence. So but this is why th these traditions are called direct. This is the essence of direct in direct realization. So when our senses are more open, including our mind, then we have the direct experience that there are no separate objects, there are no separate bodies, and that all of these experiences of diversity are arising within a continuum, a continuousness, a continuous livingness of which everything is a part of. So the, the main analogy that's used is waves in the ocean that waves have a sort of quasi-independent existence. They're arising from the ocean, but you can't really tell where a wave begins or ends. And it's made of ocean. It is made by ocean and it's made of ocean. So all of the diversity that we experience is like those waves in an ocean of consciousness and energy, arising and subsiding naturally, but made of the exact substrate that's giving rise to it. And even further on, what we can experience when our inner eyes really open is that all of this is made of wisdom. So the diversity that we experience when we are still bound by dualistic karmic vision is limited experience. And it gives rise to all kinds of things like the need to defend this self because now we think it's separate and fragile and drifting around in space and, and we have to be, we have to defend it in some way. The diversity that we experience when our senses are more open is called in this tradition and also Dzogchen tradition, the glamour of God or the magic of God, or the magical display of God. It has a quality of magic uh, in the term, and, and the glamour means like the old school magic, like glamorizing. And when we are ex really embodying the experience of the continuity of all phenomena, then diversity is enjoyed like a magical display rather than feeling that we have to defend something. So when that happens, we have the experience of livingness being everywhere in everything, not just in people or animals or plants, but also in tables and cars and anything that we explore worlds. So there's a definite perception of not only the everything being imbued with this aliveness, but of also us being continuous with everything else of that aliveness and our own aliveness, not being separate and, and of the aliveness also being in what we call empty space. So this is the liberated diversity, the liberated experience of diversity. Now what Abhinavagupta is saying um, I keep losing my place here. When he says diversity is the sole cause of both bondage and deliverance is that when we are bound in a limited experience of diversity, and which really means we're having an experience of separation, we can use our ex limited experience of diversity 
to move toward a less limited experience of diversity. This is really the crux, the essence of what Abhinavagupta is saying. He's not just saying that there are these two kinds of experiences of diversity. He's saying that the limited experience of diversity is our toolbox for for discovering the unlimited experience of diversity. And this reflects a teaching that is given both in Trika and Dzogchen and in Nandamaima also gave this teaching. I think I've said it in satsang here before that the hand that you fall on, if you happen to fall on the floor is the same hand that you're going to use to push yourself up with. Meaning that your ignorance or your limited understanding of how reality actually is, the thing that trips you up all the time is the same limitation that you're going to use to help you to wake up. And we can see that exact parallel happening right now. So, but first let me just make it very ordinary, which is that as human beings, we have these beautiful, this beautiful sensory apparatus. We have these dexterous, limbs, and we can play with all of the objects of our world in order to do what's called sadhana, our spiritual practice. We can like set up altars and wave lights around and chant mantras and sing kirtan and play harmonium and work with teachers who seem to be separate beings somehow. Uh, You know, we can do all of this with all of the objects, including the people objects in our lives. We call it sadhana and and magically working with all of those things in a dualistic way leads to having an experience of continuity and the real nature of the self. So it's a general principle. This is one of the very few number of, of principles that works all the way through reality, which is that working with the limited leads directly to the unlimited. This is a fundamental principle of reality. Working with the limited leads directly to the unlimited. It's almost like a through line. We're working with objects, doing sadhana, given to us by that merciful self, cosmic self. And it's almost like we're walking, walking, walking along the through line into that experience of limited objects becomes the experience of unlimited continuity. So this is what Abhinavagupta is talking about. It's a fundamental principle of sadhana in all of the direct realization traditions, that we have this toolbox of things that are in our ordinary lives, and it helps us to discover something extraordinary. For instance, in one of the central tantras, texts, or scriptures of this tradition called the Vigyana Bhairava Tantra, there's advice given to use very, very ordinary everyday phenomena to help us to discover the state of the Lord. So ordinary as a sneeze. You know, advice is given to sn- that when you sneeze, pause, and in the moment after the sneeze, you will be in a condition more like the Lord. The sneeze clears out a lot of conceptual mind and there's specific advice given about what to do in the moment after you sneeze so that you can realize more of what that experience of continuity and divinity is. There's a lot of advice like this about how to use our everyday lives to help us to wake up. We have an an ongoing experience of a lot of limitation. We call it uh, racism and many, many other things. We have, a, you know, that very limited experience and through that very limited experience, slowly, slowly, slowly over time, we are learning to be less limited through that limitation. People who have been designated white and people who have been designated people of color are, you know, in it together in this process of wisdom being revealed through limitation. Everything works like this. 